So let me introduce the first speaker for you today. Um, this is John Miner. So John is here from SCOD. Um, he'll be doing a live presentation. So if you have questions, can you please post them in the chat room? So John um, works with SCODE, which is a for-profit social enterprise based in Nakuru in Kenya. They've been in operation since 2008 and SCODE produces and promotes a wide range of renewable energy so solutions. They've been the recipient of two of our funding programmes, the first of which was TRID, which completed earlier this year, and you can find their final report on our website. And they're currently wrapping up their first programme, which was um, LEIA. I'll hand over to you then, John. Um, hello, everyone. Hello. Morning. Hello. Hello. This is afternoon here. Um, Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jane. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. You're very clear, That's... thank you. Okay, okay fine. Uh, just uh, quickly, just uh, to re just uh, talk about SCOD. Uh, SCOD is a Kenyan um, grassroots community development organization whose mission is to facilitate adoption of cleaner energy technologies and sustainable land use approaches through capacity building and applied, applied research for enhanced livelihood. So the two projects that we were um, uh, lucky to get funded from MEX very well falls within our core mandate of uh, promoting the adoption of cleaner energy technologies and sustainable land use approaches using applied research to improve people's livelihoods. Um, next, thank you very much. Like Jane said, we are we were fortunate enough to have two of our projects funded by MEX. The first one was the development and evaluation of a direct current solar electric pressure cooker unit, which was a 12 months project. We are currently uh, winding it up. And the second project was a shorter one, which was about developing and testing innovative user-friendly LPG financing models to accelerate uptake of LPG among rural poor through mobile pay. That was a six months project. We've already wound it up. And there's uh, a report that uh, you can um, see at Mac's uh, website. Next, please. Thank you. Yeah, the e-cooking, as we popularly refer to it, a project uh, whose aim was to develop and evaluate a direct current electric pressure cooker unit in households without grid connection and those connected to unreliable grid in two locations in Kenya. That was Mogotio and Baruk locations in Nakuru County in Kenya. Uh, how we went about this is that the first thing we did was uh, to carry out a baseline survey. In the two project locations to clearly understand the situation as far as cooking energy demand and supplies was concerned. And the second one was to carry out a desk review of existing DC electric pressure cookers available in the market. Next. Um, out of the baseline survey and our desk, uh, desk review, we had ideas about what kind of a DC electric pressure cooking unit we would then assemble using components and parts from the market. And we assembled a, a, a prototype of DC electric pressure cooker unit. We tested its performance and affordability of the same uh, cooking uh, electric uh, unit using water boiling tests here in our workshop at SCOD. And we also conducted controlled cooking tests with the same unit here in our workshop and then 
Once we were satisfied, we took it out there and we tested it with the communities using protocols in the uh, kitchen performance test. And then we also tested the consumer financing models with the communities out there in the field, in the two locations. Next, please. And what we found out is that uh, in terms of performance, the DC electric pressure cookers are slow in raising temperatures to boiling point. They take less power and therefore they take a long time to raise temperatures to boiling point. But once the temperature reach, uh, temperatures reach a boiling point, they're very good in cooking. The other one is power consumption of the DC electric pressure cookers is exaggerated by the manufacturers. We imported uh, pressure cookers, DC pressure cookers. We only found one manufacturer from China who was manufacturing the DC pressure cookers. We imported them. And when we checked or cross-checked the technical specifications given by the manufacturer, we realized that they were exaggerated. And the other one is that they generally, so generally, uh, it's cheaper to cook using to cook boiled or stewed food using EPCs than charcoal or kerosene here in Kenya. Summary of findings uh, in terms of uh, affordability. Initially, we had set ourselves to use um, the more superior lithium ion batteries. But when we got into this experiment, we realized that uh, though they are superior, they are much more expensive and would make our cooking electric pressure cooking unit and affordable to the target communities that we had in mind. We also realized that good quality DC, uh, AC inverters are very expensive. At some point when we were um, experimenting with the DC, um, pressure cookers, we realized, uh, we were informed by MEX that uh, the DC pressure cookers had some um, safety uh, problems that uh, needed to be dealt with before we could deploy them in the communities. And so we, we moved on with the AC pressure cookers. And so we had to uh, purchase um, reliable or good quality AC inverters. And we realized that the price was like uh, much higher than uh, what we were buying the panels for. So the cost of that unit, the first one, the highest was the batteries, then the second one was good quality inverters. The panels, the prices have come down, and I think they're substantially uh, more affordable than they were when we were starting the experiment. But inverters, good ones, are still a problem. And if you're doing cooking, then you need very good quality inverters that will not blow when you are using the, uh, the appliance continuously. Next, please. Uh, sorry, back, a little bit back. Um, yeah. This, the second, sorry. Next, next, sorry. Yeah, so the next project was uh, developing and testing innovative user-friendly um, LPG financing models to accelerate uptake among rural poor through mobile pay. And how we went about it is that we had a baseline survey, which again was conducted through field data collection in the project location to better understand the cooking energy demand and supply situation in the project location. And we also did a desk review of existing LPG consumer financing models available in the Kenyan market, especially in the locations that we were conducting the study. Uh, next. Just before I get into this um, uh, slide, I need to explain that um, our LPG project was meant to complement the e-cooking project in terms of cooking so that for those, for those clients or for those participants who had already obtained electric pressure cooker, whenever they 
who are for one reason or, or the other unable to use the pressure cooker for their cooking, then we wanted to see whether they could fall back to LPG other than the charcoal, firewood and kerosene that they were used to before. So it was supposed to be a complementary uh, fuel to electric uh, cooking. And so we assembled a prototype for LPG cooking. What is found in the market is uh, you have a, the most popular one is six kilogram cylinders with a, um, a burner screwed at the top and a grill, a grill around the top of the cylinder. And that was um, for us uh, in the baseline survey, we found out that that was a challenge to people because they couldn't make more than one meal. In the Kenyan context, people make like uh, two meals at the same time, if not more. You have some vegetables, you have some ugali, or you have some stew going on, or you have some water that you have, you're warming while you are cooking. And that uh, six kilogram LPG cooking unit did not provide that. And every time you are unscrewing the burner, you ended up uh, losing a bit of gas. So we modified that and brought um, a two burner uh, cooker plus a gas regulator and wanted to see how this would fare in terms of uh, uh, improving on the acceptability or acceptance of LPG cooking, especially among rural folks. So we assembled a prototype which had uh, a double burner, a gas regulator, and a six kilogram uh, gas cylinder. We tested it in our workshop here for its performance and affordability and in the field. So for, in the workshop, we did water boiling tests. So we also did controlled cooking uh, tests. We invited people, uh, especially uh, women who, are, uh, who, are, um, who have the responsibility of cooking in homes, and they did the testing. They, brought, they, they cooked all manner of foods, and we got feedback from there. And then later on, we took the cooking kit out into the fields and performed kitchen performance tests with a sample of about 150 households in the project uh, locations. And we also tested consumer financing models that uh, we had uh, put together for financing customers, end user customers for LPG. Next, please. Uh, we developed uh, an LPG mobile pay application we tested the, the, the effectiveness of the mobile pay app among sample households in the study area on ease of payment for LPG in small amounts. Uh, ordinarily, uh, the people who are participating in this uh, experiment are used to buy small quantities of either charcoal, kerosene, or firewood on a daily basis or every so often. And therefore, we wanted to see how this could be used uh, and be aligned to that kind of uh, purchasing of fuel. And then the effectiveness of supply of LPG to end users, getting it there. Because the other challenge that we found customers or uh, potential end users had is that uh, whenever they uh, emptied their cylinders, they couldn't get a ready uh, supply. So that made, I mean, made them not um, rely fully on LPG. They had other fallback fuels that they would use whenever LPG uh, got exhausted. So we wanted to make sure that there was a supply and we established uh, hubs for supplying very close to those communities so that every time they had their gas exhausted, uh, they could uh, get a refill uh, within the shortest time possible. And the other one was displaying instituted among LPG users for payment of LPG consumed. They themselves reminding themselves and paying voluntarily without reminding them that um, you know uh, their gas is over and they needed to do something about it, actually pay the full amount or so make sure that they can check their account and see how much they need to top so that they can get a refill. Next, please. And then what we found, uh, just a summary, uh, very general ones, is generally the mobile pay app helped households increase consumption of LPG. That communication and the fact that it allowed people to deposit small amounts of money over a period of time so that by the time their gas is exhausted, 
then they have already saved or they have already uh, deposited a substantial amount of the money that they will need to get a refill. Let's say that they have completed or they are nearly completing. It's easy for them to top up. The other one is uh, a number of LPG users, users still prefer to pay for their LPG refills in lump sum amounts. We still found that uh, there are quite a number of people in this experiment who still prefer to wait until they you know, they are bringing their cylinder for a refill and pay at that point in time. And I think uh, that, uh, you know, has a number of ways of explaining it. One is that um, even though we thought that, uh, you know, when people are not buying the firewood or the charcoal or the kerosene, they would be making um, savings and they would be using those savings to deposit into their LPG accounts. There's so many other competing needs. And so you find that into something else and you know the, 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 uh, the client hoping that uh, the time they will need to refill their LPG cylinder they will find some money somewhere so that they can they, they can top up so that uh, sometimes uh, has not worked very well has created some gaps but overall I think uh, it has worked well because it has increased their consumption of LPG then consumer financing model that integrates LPG equipment appliances with LPG refills is more attractive. Where you giving people or your okay, appliance like uh, the cook the LPG cooking kit we talked about, and then assuring them of refills over the period uh, within which they will be paying for uh, their equipment. They are happier that way. You spread that payment, and then they are becoming for refills and they'll be paying that alongside their appliance so that they don't have to go elsewhere. Uh, yeah, so that's, um, that is it uh, from our end, the two projects. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. So we, we've had quite a few questions, but I'm mindful that we've got two other presentations first. So um, if it's OK with you, I'll leave them until the end. and We can come back to them and hopefully it generate a little bit more discussion about what's happened in the other projects, too. So let me move on to our second presentation for today. This is can I introduce Lawrence Caccioni? He's the proprietor of Caccioni Limited. They're a Malawian based um, company and they've been providing Malawi-made solar systems for over four years. So like Scood, they've also um, been the recipient of two um, funding programmes. Somebody has their um, voice on. Could you just switch it off for a second, please? I've got an echo. Thank you. Um, so as I, as I just said, Caccioni have um, received recent funding through our layer two program which is the low energy inclusive appliances that we ran with the energy saving trust but we're also recipients from um, our trid program so i'll hand over to you lawrence thank you Hello, this is the presentation for Kachione LLC, which did a MEC innovation grant in Malawi focused on new business models to provide access to low income villagers. My name is Robert Van Buskirk. I am uh, providing the narration for Lawrence Kachione because of uh, technical di difficulties of doing the recording in Malawi. And uh, the short, short title for our project is Providing Electric Cooking Access to Low-Income Villagers in Malawi, because that's a more succinct way of saying what we do. Our customers have no access to grid electricity. Their income is only about $1 per day per person, sometimes less. <clears throat> they have unsteady seasonal income that's based on an annual crop harvest 
That makes it very difficult for them to make monthly payments, so PAYGO models don't work for them. Uh, they can pay about a maximum of $100 to $200 for a starter modern energy cooking system. So that is the financial constraints that our project works. What do our customers cook? We estimated the cooking food requirements by doing household surveys of how much of different types of food they purchase and consume. Um, from those surveys, we estimate that the wet weight of different foods includes approximately two kilograms per day per person of encima, 340 grams per day per person of rice, uh, half a kilogram or 500, gra 500 grams per day per person of vegetables, 250 grams per person per day of beans, 280 grams of fish and eggs, 90 grams of chicken and goat, and four to five liters of warm wash water per day. How much cooking energy is required? for this consumption. Um, we estimate that uh, based on uh, cooking tests of the different food types, we estimate that the uh, encima requirement per, per person per day requires about 331 watt hours. Uh, the beans requires about 76 watt hours per day. Rice requires 50 watt hours per day. Vegetables, 75 watt hours per day fish and eggs, 65 per person. Chicken and goat, because it's only once per month, is about 19 watt hours per day per person. And wash water is about um, 100 watt hours per day per person. This totals about 716 watt hour per day per person. Cooking and water heating energy required. What do efficient Africa-made solar electric cookers look like? Um, very well insulated. So uh, what we do, the lower left-hand picture shows the diode heating element on the bottom of a stainless steel pot. That stainless steel pot is then put in an insulated environment, uh, basically a plastic bucket with insulation around it. And then there's a lid put on top of the pot, an extra insulating pi pillow, and a final lid. This makes a very highly insulated, highly efficient uh, cooking pot that's uh, very good at uh, warming water over the course of the day. How much cooking energy can customers afford to purchase initially, uh, given their limited financial means? With customers that can afford about $1 to $200 for a starter system, how much energy they can purchase depends on the price of the system. So if the system is $2 per peak watt of system capacity, that would mean that we, they would be able to purchase only 50 to 100 uh, watt peak of, of solar electric cooking system. What we did in our project, we got the price down to $1 per peak watt. That allowed our customers to purchase a system that was basically 150 watts peak. Uh, in 2021, we expect to get the price further down to approximately 65 cents per peak watt of system capacity. That should enable our customers to, 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 to purchase larger systems of up to 300 watts peak. A 300 watt peak system can provide one kilowatt hour per day of cooking electricity for a household, which potentially is almost half of the cooking energy requirement of a small household of two to three people. How do our customers use the cooker? Well, our customers taught us how to use solar electric cookers efficiently and effectively in their village circumstances. What they taught us is that the best way to use a cooker is to keep it plugged in all day, fill it with as much water as possible, have the water heat up in the morning, and then the customers use the, the hot water during lunch for cooking and tea, and then they, they, they replace the lunch hot water with cold water, which then heats up again in the afternoon. And they get the hot water in the afternoon for dinner and washing. 
And this is a very efficient way of utilizing the cooker, especially when there's variable electricity from day to day and when they have uh, sufficient limitate, uh, substantial limitations and constraints, the uh, energy capacity of the system because they can only afford uh, a, a limited size on the solar panel. Uh, what are our next steps? We're lowering our system costs over the next year by uh, increasing economies of scale. We're importing both cooker parts and solar panels uh, by the container that lowers the cost by a factor of 30 to 50 percent. We're improving the cost efficiency and operating efficiency of cooker design. We're developing a system to reward customers for using the cooker system well. Um, uh, we're going to we're going to reward them by giving them discounts for system expansion if they save wood and save energy and improve their health by by, by using solar electricity. And we're going to plan and prepare for a big scale up effort in 2022. What are suggestions for Max? Um, we we've had good success. Uh, satisfying our customers by focusing on super affordable solutions, uh, solutions that can be affordable for all customers. And the key way we do this is we focus on heating water for cooking. That's the step most of the cooking requirement is basically boiling water anyways. And um, and so when you when you focus on the heating water, then the water is the battery itself and you don't need a battery. And in addition, you can heat water without with a minimum of electronics. So it's basically just the solar panel and the cooker, which provides an extremely affordable system. Uh, the other suggestion is um, if you pick customers, commit to those customers, and then adapt the technology to those customers, then uh, the technology is adapting to the customer needs and you have a better long-term prospect of, of satisfying customers than, than, than if you technology first and then run around and, and, and look for customers and markets for the technology, right? So at least there should be both sides. You shouldn't, you shouldn't just pick technology and then find the customers to match the technology. You should, you should develop a long-term commitment to your customers and then adapt the technology to those customer needs. Um, in addition, in our context in rural Malawi, there just is not proper disposal of batteries. So um, for those low-income communities, uh, uh, um, pushing battery systems is incredibly problematic. It'll produce um, a, a big increase in battery use. Those batteries will not be disposed of properly and create uh, toxic risks for the low-income communities. Um, if if Max really wants to push battery-based systems, then it needs to needs to help um, make sure that there's proper environmental disposal of lithium batteries wherever those systems are going to be promoted. So, um, those are our suggestions. We hope this is uh, useful to the Max community and to the larger effort of getting uh, modern and solar electric cooking to low-income Africans in general. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, um, Robert and Lawrence. <laughs> so now I'm going to hand over to um, the last but not least of our presentations today. So there's a slight change to the advertised agenda. Um, Wendy Sanisi is going to present it for EarthSpark. She's the director of their Haiti operations, so he's kind of well placed to talk about the work that EarthSpark have been doing in Haiti. They've been working there since 2009, where they developed the first uh, solar powered microgrids. And in 2012, they turned on a privately operated prepaid microgrid in Les Anglaises which is a small town in Haiti that has never before had grid electricity. In 2015, they expanded the grid, which serves over 2,000 people with 24-hour electricity. This is primarily powered by solar energy and battery storage. They've managed to cut customers' energy costs by up to 
Um, so Earthspark have recently submitted their final report, which is currently under review for their um, layer one project. So I'll hand over to you, um, Wendy. Thank you. Joni, there doesn't appear to be any sound. We're having problems, Jamie. Yeah, I lost connectivity then. Let me just share again, including Thank you. sound. Good morning, everyone. My name is Wendy Sanofi and I will present first broken Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I will okay. be presenting you some of our findings from the implementation of an on and off microgrid PV electric cooking project that was implemented in the town of Les Anglais in southern Haiti. So in most of Haiti and especially in rural areas, charcoal is still the most commonly used cooking fuel. So charcoal impacts very negatively on the local environment and you can see some uh, erosion in Les Anglais. However, Cooking participants were more concerned on the impacts of charcoal on their health, mentioning how the smoke would irritate their eyes and their throat, and on their finances. And it's not surprising because when you look at the figures that were collected from the participants, we found out that there was some of them were spending as much as 147 US dollars per month on charcoal. And uh, throughout the project, they were able, some of them were able to make some savings, which range between 80 to 100 percent, if we disregard those who did not make any savings. Um, we will go into that more into details later. So two systems were provided to the participants. For the off-grid participants, they were provided with a sunspot, which is an integrated solar home system comprising of batteries, inverters, solar panels, uh, smart meters and the uh, cooking appliances. It also had a 24 volt USB port from where uh, light could be connected and also two AC outlets from where you could charge a phone or a small electrical appliance like a radio. For the on-grid system, the, the participants had the spark stove. The spark stove consists of two smart meters and each of them had their individual on and off switch, and those were mounted in a piece of plywood in the wall. Um, for both the on-grid and the off-grid systems, participants had like a meter connected to each appliance to make sure that data monitoring and data collection is done in a very granular way. And of course, like each participant were provided with two cooking appliances. So one of them was an electric pressure cooker and secondly, an induction cooktop. Three months into the project, a satisfaction survey was conducted with the participants to gather some feedback from them. Four main benefits were identified. First of all, the system is very clean. No more smoke that's going to dirty the hands, dirty the pots and the walls, and a smoke that's going to irritate the fruit and the eyes. 
Secondly, the system is so convenient because it's located indoors, meaning that you don't have to physically leave the house to cook. That was the case with the traditional Haitian kitchen. Thirdly, cooking is very efficient and fast. So, for example, cooking beans on charcoal can take three to four hours. With the electric appliance, it can take one hour to have everything ready. And a participant even mentioned how the system is so fast that since she has acquired it, there is not a single day that a kid has gone to school without eating. And now the fourth, the fourth benefit is that participants have been saving a lot of money that they haven't spent on charcoal. Savings were recorded to be between 80 to 100 percent for those who made savings. Of course, some participants did not save any money because they uh, they still use charcoal for some other business. Some other impacts were identified. For instance, participants reported not to be exposed anymore to the uncomfortable heat and smoke of charcoal for hours. This has made the cooking experience in itself a more pleasant one. Another impact was on the participants' finances. Money previously spent on charcoal is now diverted towards children's schooling and in some cases to the business. So not only money is saved, but extra revenue can be generated as more business supplies can be purchased and eventually resold. Thirdly, there has been a notable improvement in the participants' quality of life as they were able to relax more and spend more time taking care of themselves and of their respective families. So in this slide, you can see one of our ungrid cooking participants who has acquired an electric pressure cooker. So when I went to see her on that day, it was one month into the cooking pilot and she asked me to follow her into the depot to show me where she's now keeping her charcoal stove. She was very happy because she was able to eliminate charcoal completely from her kitchen. So there were a few challenges that were mentioned uh, in relation to cooking with electricity. One of them was the size of the EPC. Uh, so many Haitian meals include rice and beans, which can be very voluminous, and some of them include breadfruit that are cooked as a whole. Um, so in those cases, the six quart EPC that was provided to the participant wasn't always sufficient. So that was uh, one complaint from the participant. A second disadvantage was the interruption of cooking due to power outages for the off customers. Uh, maybe they are like planned or unplanned outages. And for the off customers, it was uh, in times of bad weather, maybe the sunspot couldn't charge enough to allow them to cook. So they had to use charcoal as a backup cooking fuel. This slide shows some data collected from the smart meters and uh, impact on the microgrid load. So you can compare the, the pressure cooker and the induction stove in the table. And we have seen, interestingly, that there were more events using the induction stove compared to the pressure cooker. One explanation could be that pressure cooker takes a longer time to reach to a higher temperature than the induction stove, such that events like boiling water, making tea and coffee, would most likely be done using the induction stove rather than the pressure cooker. Uh, the total electricity consumed for cooking from the pressure cooker accounted for only like 30.5% of the total electricity consumed. And um, you can see in the chart below that uh, there has been an increase in the, in the grid load uh, due to electric cooking. And for October alone, there has been 20% increase in the microgrid load. If you want to scale up electric cooking and have it part of a microgrid model, a few improvements need to take place. First of all, the grid design and grid sizing need to take into consideration the electric cooking. We have seen from the previous load how much the cooking load have impacted the load curve in this only. Secondly, 
if we want to make sure that our production is always meeting our demand, there are a few solutions. We can use demand side management where some loads can be curtailed at times, or we could like stagger the cooking loads so that not everyone is cooking at the same time, which could lead to system overload and blackouts. Thirdly, a larger EPC. Uh, we have obtained like feedback from the participants that the EPC was sometimes too small uh, and it was an, a six quad uh, pressure cooker. There are eight quads pressure cookers on the market that could be sourced should the project be scaled up. And this would help to meet some of the uh, Haitian cooking needs. And fourthly, uh, if we are able to find an EPC with a French interface, it would definitely enhance the participants' uh, experience because right now the one that we were able to find was in a foreign language such that not all the functionalities of the pressure cooker were being used. So this sums up the summary of our findings for the electric cooking pilot. I hope you have enjoyed the presentation and I thank you for your attention. That's great. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers this morning. So we've got quite a number of questions that have come into the chat box. Um, before we move on, I think the question for me, Wendy, is the, you mentioned that um, the EPCs weren't large enough. Did anybody ask for um, extra parts or a divided part for the EPC? Uh, yes, Jen. So um, we uh, some of the participants did report that the EPC was too was too small, but for some of them, uh, like families of five to six, maybe eight persons, they they found that it was the right size. Um, they were they were saying yes if you can if in the future we can get like bigger pots that would have been uh, that would have been like really really great for them for the induction uh, cooked up what we did uh, we also provided some pots uh, but we didn't get like really good quality pots uh, for them some of them were too small too too thin um, so some food would get burned sometimes and to know that. The pots that we can get on the market in uh, rural Haiti or in the south where we are, like near the big towns, they could be uh, outside of the price point that most participants would be able to afford. So, um, yeah, we, we're trying to work how we can actually improve, uh, maybe improve the supply chain for um for the pots um, yeah, and the and the electric pressure cookers as well. So um, yeah. yeah, it sounds like a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I've just um, we there are two questions that have coming for for you, Wendy. Um, the first one is for the increased load on the mini grid. What proportion of the mini grid customers were e cooking? And the, the comment is the 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 addition to the non-cooking load is surprisingly low. Yes, uh, so for this question in Les Anglais right now we have about 450 customers and we had uh, 20 on-grid participants. So, um, so if we make a small calculation this gives us um, to about 4%. So, um, so as you probably know, like most of the electric appliances that we have on the market, even though they are very efficient when used at uh, lower temperatures or like lower settings, uh, most of them are above one kilowatt power rating, so they can consume a lot of power. And we have noticed how uh, since the, the participants have been using electricity for cooking, the cooking frequency has increased a lot for them. So um, they would it's it's so convenient that they are just so happy to use it all the time. Uh, so you know that uh, in the town where where I work in Les Anglais and for like Earthspark mini grids, um, some some customers they can they they use up to like thirty watts of for their power their power limit. So it's pretty small, 
and because many of those customers, all they can afford is lighting or like charging their phone. So we have some customers that have like really, really small consumption. So that's why when you compare the cooking load um, and the small customers, which make up the highest percentage of our customer of our customers uh, in our grids. So you can see that yeah, the impact of cooking, of electric cooking on our total load tend to be quite significant. Okay, thanks. Does that answer your question, Matt? Yes, perfect, thank you. Thank you, okay. So Wendy, I'm gonna stay with the questions for EarthSpark and then we'll kind of move back to, to the SCOED questions. So a question from John Barton. He's asked if you've studied um, any other electrical loads, what are the other big users of electricity? Uh, in terms of in terms of cooking or you mean in general, maybe I think it's in general. Can, okay, yeah. In general in Les Anglais, most of our most of our loads uh, come from freezer customers. So customers who have like a freezer or two plugged in in their homes and uh, most we have, um, uh, they don't represent the highest proportion of customers, but they do represent the highest proportion of load in our grids. Uh, so yeah, it is the freezers that actually, um, yeah, are the highest consumers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then um, there's a question about data on the impact of the EPCs. Do you have any data? Um, of how they've impacted the microgrid electrical demand versus the impact of induction cookers? Uh, yes, we do have those figures uh, and I can look for it if you want and I can share it afterwards. I don't have it uh, in front of me right now, but um, we, we did like, compare the other the usage of like different appliances. Um, we did find that um, there was, I think, uh, maybe it was in my presentation, um, like the, the number of cooking events and the number of kilowatt hour that was uh, consumed uh, by the production cooked up was higher, was higher than um, for the EPC. So, um, yeah, if you if you want, I can share you more. I can share more details. Um, I can look for the information if you don't mind. Brilliant. So Will's actually posted his email address on there for you, Wendy. I think he's quite keen if you could share that data with him. Thank you. Yes. Sure. And then finally, um, the cooking load appears to peak in the middle of the day and is low in the evening when other loads. So is this a characteristic of refugee settlements? Uh, so, uh, so these only don't really like. Um, it's a very rural community, it's not a refugee settlement. And uh, just that most people will tend to make a big meal during the day. Um, like this is the profile that we notice like for, um, for most people when they are using charcoal. So they would make one big meal maybe during the morning or midday and, uh, and prepare, prepare the food to be ready for lunch. So now with the electric pressure cookers and the induction cooked up available, they don't need to start cooking at 5 or 8 a.m. They can start cooking uh, like around 11 and then the food is ready by 1 p.m. So that's why you see that peak in the middle, which is like very convenient for us because this is when we have the highest solar production. And um, so it's like uh, we are using, we're, we're, we're making the most of our solar production and not just like, using a lot of our batteries or having to use the backup generator that we have. Okay, that's great. Well, I think there's quite a number of people that are interested in your data, so I'll send you an email with their, with their contact details afterwards, Wendy. But no thanks problem. for your presentation, it's really interesting and for answering those questions. I'm going to jump right back to the questions that we um, received at the start of SCODE's presentation. So, John, if I can ask you to respond to the questions that are coming forward. So we've got a question from Simon that says, when you say it takes a long time, um, and I think this is re referring to the cooking with the EPC, 
can you compare this with the time for lighting a charcoal stove and getting the same amount of water or food to boil? Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you, um, thank you, Jen. Uh, I just mentioned that um, the DC or the direct current um, pressure cookers took longer to bring um, water to boil as opposed to uh, say charcoal or kerosene. But once the water uh, was at boiling point, maintaining and using it for cooking was much better than um, charcoal or uh, kerosene or firewood. So in terms of um, in terms but when, of uh, but when you example, say that, John, the experience. Sorry, John, when you say yeah. that, are you yeah. are you thinking? getting the charcoal stove out, loading it with charcoal, uh, lighting it, waiting for it to get to heat, putting the pan on and then bringing to boil uh, yeah. compared to the DC cooker, uh, switch it on, get it to boil. Because uh, yeah. I can understand how a fully lit charcoal stove raises the temperature of water quicker than the DC. But if we take into account the setting up of charcoal, question? Yes, um, what we did was to light. Setting up of charcoal was already done, like the charcoal was already in the cook stove. So it's lighting time, having that charcoal light, water on top. And for our case, on average, we're, we're seeing uh, the EPC, the DC EPC taking, for example, 45 minutes to bring that water, five liters to boil, and about 20 minutes for the charcoal stove to bring that water to boil. Of course, it is the preparation that you have to do uh, for the charcoal stove. But once it, uh, that is done, it has charcoal and you're lighting it, the time it takes for that charcoal to light and bring that water to boil, you compare that with the time that it takes for you to switch on the EPC, the DC EPC, and the time it takes to bring that water to boil, there was that difference. And for our case, on average, it was like uh, the, e the DC EPC would take like 45 minutes to bring that water to boil, while a charcoal stove would uh, uh, take like uh, 20 minutes to bring that water to boil. So that's what I meant. But once that water was brought to a boil, then of course uh, the uh, pressure cooker did much better than um, the charcoal. For example, the charcoal cook stove took about four hours to cook um, two kilograms of githeri, while the EPC, the DC EPC took two and a half hours to boil the same amount of, I mean, to cook the same amount of uh, githeri. So uh, clearly you can see, I mean, you wait uh, slightly longer with the uh, EPC, DC, EPC to get the food to boil, but once it gets to boil, then of course uh, it does much better and the period, overall period is much shorter and use less energy or it's less, um, use less cost. I hope that that clarifies that. I don't know if that's clear enough. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, yeah. Although I'm surprised it took two and a half hours to do the githeri. Uh, do you know Do you know what temperature the EPC is working at? Is the DC EPC working at a slightly lower pressure than AC EPCs? Because uh, githeri should be one and a quarter hours maybe. Yes, I think it's working at a lower um, pressure than uh, the AC because, yeah, like you're saying, AC, AC uh, EPC takes like one hour to cook the githeri, and of course it takes much more power. Uh, we're talking about uh, 200, 250 watts DC EPC compared to about 1,000 watts of uh, AC EPC. Yeah. Of course, yeah, you, you're talking about uh, two different uh, power scenarios here. Yeah, although, of course, so once they the... would bring uh, the food and the water to a boil much faster. Yeah. 
All right, thank you. Yeah. OK, thanks, John. Um, in relation to the um, the power consumption, so you mentioned that the EPC manufacturers exaggerated it. So there's a question that asks, do you mean that the manufacturers figures were higher or lower than in testing? They were higher. For example, you find um, a, a, a 400, no, a 250 watts EPC rated as 400 watt EPC. So when you test it, you find that it's uh, 250, while the specifications on that particular EPC is 400 watts. So you're buying something that is totally different from what you eventually um, uh, get on the ground. And we found out that when we were testing them in our actual peer. OK, that yeah, that has quite a significant impact, doesn't it, on use? So can we just move on? You mentioned the safety concerns for the DC pressure cookers. So um, Simon is asking if that was a concern about the wiring and how does the safety compare to a manual pressure cooker that the user has to ensure is not overheated? Yeah, I'm joined by Marcy here. She might want to say something about um, uh, the, the safety issues. But one of them is that uh, we found that um, the 12 volts DC electric pressure cookers had a problem with the cables or too thin to take the kind of current that was required uh, to do the cooking. So they kept on melting, heating and melting. So that, that's one uh, safety concern that we had and we ruled them out. And we opted for the 24 volts uh, uh, DC electric pr uh, pressure cookers, which didn't have that uh, problem with their wiring. That's Master, might want to add on something. The other concern that was brought to our attention was the valve. Um, it was incapable of self-regulating, uh, self-cleaning, so as to be able to self-regulate the pressure inside. So it had the risk of exploding. Okay, and and this, is, this is an issue that was brought to our attention by, by Max, and I think it's, um, Simon is very much in the team that is working on this. Uh, we didn't experience it in the field. We had actually uh, tested it in our workshop here. We, were, we had uh, even uh, purchased all the units that we needed. They were in our warehouse. We were about to start deploying them out there in the field when we had a conversation with the, the MAX team that was participating in the Google, in the Google um, forum in Nairobi. And I said there was that issue of safety, especially the pressure release valves. And we needed to uh, halt further uh, work or further deployment of the DC EPCs until that is sorted out between the Crest and the manufacturer of the DC EPCs. That is still ongoing, uh, but it's not that uh, we really had any any case or any incident out here, either in our workshop or with customers. And the surprising thing is uh, we uh, we did those. Uh, those uh, EPCs, DC EPCs, replace them with the AC EPCs so that we can complete our project. But the people who experienced them before, they're still holding on to them because we had already started, I mean, deployed a number of them. And they had started using them, you know, just ordinarily in their own cooking setting because they had this solar power system that was powering them and they had already started getting excited. And they're holding on to that. Some of them are saying we keep them safely, we'll not use them, but uh, we would want to uh, only hand them off once we are assured that uh, they are not safe to use. So it tells you, I mean, uh, that they're already impressed with their performance, but then we uh, have had this uh, safety issue that we needed to have sorted out first before we can give any green light to them use. Okay, no, that's great. Thanks, John. So I've, the, Simon's just put an update that he was um, he was interested in kind of sharing your 
um, experience of the of the EPCs and the problems that you've had. So thank you for updating. Um, we have one final question, which asks about your conclusion about lithium ion batteries being more expensive than lead acid. And does that explanation take into account the expected longer life of lithium ion, as well as its ability for deeper discharge? Yeah, um, Masi can, um, would want to say something about that. Yeah, we did that analysis in our experiment and I think we documented it, but uh, I think in short she can uh, say something about it. In terms of the cost, it's, uh, it's cheaper in the long run to have lithium ion because uh, the lifespan is of course between uh, 10 to 20 years as opposed to lithium, which is about uh, uh, we are, as opposed to lead acid, which is about uh, five to ten years, so it's basically double. And uh, the depth of discharge, of course, for lithium ion might be around eighty percent, while lead acid is just uh, fifty percent. However, the upfront cost that the customer will have to to cough up. Eh? To be able to own the lithium, uh, the lithium ion battery is quite high of, uh, at about a um, hundred. Yeah, so it's that perception, isn't it? And that initial outlay. Yes. Yeah, it's a hundred thousand Kenya shillings as opposed to around 30,000 Kenya shillings. That's okay. a huge difference, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I think that was our main concern. Uh, in terms of disposal, uh, we already have a, a fairly well working system for disposal of lead acid batteries. Uh, so that wasn't um, going to be an issue, but we needed to explore the disposal system for lithium ion batteries, whether they could still uh, flow through the same system. But we didn't get that far because we realized that uh, the upfront cost for lithium ion batteries, and again, they are not that much available. Uh, I think there are only a few uh, stockists uh, in the country, and you have to order them, you have to wait for them. So, in terms of uh, daily use, that was also a challenge to us, uh, aside from the a huge upfront cost, almost like three times what it would cost one to buy or to get lithium, I mean, a lead acid battery in the market. The lead acid batteries are widespread. Yeah, OK. Well, I noticed that we're already ran over time, but we've still got a number of questions that are, um, have been posted in the chat. So if you're happy, we'll kind of carry on for another 10 minutes. Is that OK with you, Joni? Yes, fine with me. OK, so I'm going to try and move this along a little bit quicker. Um, so where are we? I think most of the questions that were asked of Caccioni, of Robert has managed to answer them online. Um, if there's anything that anyone's posted that hasn't been responded to, could you please just bring it up now and we can hopefully get that, that question posted. So please feel free to open your mic if your question hasn't been responded to. John, there was a question about the pay, go, pay as you go LPG and whether that was more expensive than standard LPG. Um, yes, I think that was a good question. Why we opted for PAYGO is that we wanted to avoid the, the high upfront cost for metering. And the app did not cost anything more. I mean, we use very simple um, app that was using text messages so that anybody with a smartphone or um, an ordinary phone would be able to communicate and get text messages across, and it was basically for ordering, for receiving, and for payment. It cost uh, the customers 
nothing extra uh, for our case. I think it was very cheap to uh, to manage it in terms of the running costs, but in terms of the, its effectiveness, in terms of uh, getting the customers to get their refills, to get their their feedback on time, was very useful. Okay, thank so you. Paid for the LPG equipment, did not pay for the for the app in any way. Right. Thanks, John. Um, Chris, you have your hand raised. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks, Jane. Uh, this is something that could be done offline. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there's been a lot of interesting work discussed and uh, potentially some data. And <clears throat> I'm wondering if um, maybe someone could gather together a list of web links or or pointers to reports or whatever and then um, share that round. OK, so all of the um, the TRID reports are currently on the MEX web page. If you I think uh, okay. kind of post where they will be, but they're on under the publications page and there is a tab that is specifically for um, TRID challenge fund reports. So you'll find all of those there if anybody wants any more detailed information and they all have contact details for the speakers. So if you wanted to email that, them directly, you'd be able to do that there too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jane. OK. Well, I think we've answered everybody's questions up to now. If anything has anything else. Oh, um, Richard has a question for Wendy. So Wendy, when you say 1 p.m., um, was 1 p.m. always the time of the main meal in Haiti? or something which has changed since the introduction of electric cooking. And if it is something which has changed, how quickly did that change happen? Uh, yes, so uh, most, like, I, like I mentioned, most people would have their big meal in the middle of the day, uh, but uh, they would start cooking maybe at 10, 10 a.m. so that it would be ready on time. However, that, yeah, like cooking habits tend to differ depending on the activities of, of the people. Um, like we did notice that uh, at the beginning, people would still cook at the same time because probably they didn't know how long it would take for the food to be ready. Um, we we have we were collecting also like cooking diaries from the participants where they would note down uh, what time they would start cooking uh, and unfortunately some of the information collected for the diaries were not very accurate um, but I mean the change was gradual uh, for for like at the beginning but then you could see that uh, yeah once once the the participants really mastered um they were re really able to master how the appliances worked uh yeah I, I, it was like a big a big change however like why did, how how people tend to eat here it's like when the food is ready uh the meal is gonna happen right away there's no uh okay we have to eat at a specific time so um it is quite flexible it varies among it varies among the participants um, but it was, yeah, you could see like, um, it, it wasn't like abrupt, it wasn't an abrupt change. Um, and also if I can add to one of the questions that was asked before, I just checked the data and uh, concerning the consumption for the induction versus the EPC. Uh, so the induction cooked up actually consumed 1.61 kilowatt hour per hour and the EPC only uh, 0.70 kilowatt per hour. So it was uh, for the EPC, it was uh, lower consumption. So just to clarify that. OK, thank you, Wendy. I think you've posted that as well into the chat, haven't you? Yes, as well. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so and just one other point that I wanted to clarify, which was in relation to John Miner's note of um, the issues to do with the DC pressure cooker. So John Leary notes that this pressure cooker is currently undergoing comprehensive safety testing, which is part of a range of other ACE PCs in the global LEAP competition. And all of that data should be available for everyone to view um, early in the new year. So it will give a clear picture of the impact of all of those safety issues very soon. 
And I think that draws us all to a close. So can I thank all three of our speakers for their insights today? Um, really interesting to compare and contrast with the, across your work.